Okay, so uh, what we're going to do tonight is talk about the topic of coming, I call it coming to grips with time scales for cosmic and Earth history. And the basic outline I'll follow is shown here. I'm going to start by, as, uh, as Jim and Dan requested, telling you a little bit about my story, where I'm coming from, and why this is an important topic to me and how I got into it. And then we're going to talk about a little bit of uh, the history of this so-called age controversy uh, concerning the age of the Earth and the age of the universe. And then we'll talk about both biblical and scientific considerations to the topic. And then we're going to talk about a very interesting possible way to reconcile what is perceived to be a major disconnect between science and scripture on that. And then we will uh, draw some summary, summarizing type comments. Okay, so first of all, my own journey. <clears throat> uh, when I was a kid, I was growing up in San Diego. Um, I was a total ocean nut. I completely loved uh, anything water, surfing, sailing, scuba diving, you name it. And so this is a picture when I was in high school taken with me and my brothers and sisters, some of my cousins over in Hawaii where my mother grew up in Hawaii and, and uh, she, she and my father moved to San Diego when I was a youngster. And, but we would go back and forth between San Diego and Hawaii during the summers to spend time. And so anything in the ocean was good. And yet for me, it was more than just recreation. I was absolutely fascinated by the ocean as a ecosystem and as a physical system on Earth. And so I love to surf, and I spent a lot of time surfing. And my brother and I would chase waves all up and down the, uh, San Diego, the California coast, uh, up into Oregon and Washington, and over to Hawaii and down into Baja, California. Anywhere we could go, we would go. And I, but I also had a, a deep fascination with the things that lived in the ocean. And as I studied the ocean as a system, as a kid, uh, I realized there was something very special about it. But then, especially when I was in high school and I started studying chemistry, I came to realize that the ocean was really phenomenal. Among all of the systems that exist on the planets we know about, there's something incredibly special about it. And I looked at the biology of the oceans, the way that the physics of the oceans work as far as how it moderates our climate on land, how it, how it brings rainwater into the inner parts of the continents, uh, the overall energy balance, and even the, just the pure recreational aspect of being able to ride a wave on the, on the surface of the ocean. It was just all fun and fascinating. And I pondered these things very, very carefully. And, and I, I was raised in a home where basically there was no knowledge of God to speak of. My mother was an Episcopalian, but uh, she, she took me there, but I really didn't like it very well and didn't really resonate with me. But there, I, I didn't know anything about the true God, the real God, and the gospel. And yet, as I was studying and being fascinated by the ocean, what was going on inside of me is exactly what Paul describes in Romans 1.20 when he says his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. I didn't know it at the time, but God was making himself known to me through the marvels of his creation, created world, especially the ocean. And when I went to college, when I started off at UC San Diego, my very first year as a freshman, I was about halfway through it, and I got to an all-time low in my life, I mean, really low. I had pretty much given up on the political system in the U.S. Um, my family was dysfunctional as all get out, and I was depressed. And about the time I got to rock bottom, I got a call from a guy who said, may I take a survey with you? I'm here on campus, I'm serving the freshman class. Could I ask you some questions about your religious convictions? I said, I don't have any, but you're welcome to ask me. So I met with him, he asked me a series of questions, but then the last question he asked me was this. He said, if you could know and experience God personally, would you be interested? And that, chair just, uh, that, that question just about caused me to fall out of my chair. I thought, yeah, I would, because I was. I was genuinely hungry. And he then proceeded to explain the gospel to me, and in very clear terms. And you know how you hear that it takes five or six or seven exposures for somebody to embrace the gospel? Not me. I was low-hanging fruit. I was right there, and, and I responded that day, and I asked Christ into my life and became a, a Christ follower. About a year later, I was uh, rooming with a, a good friend of mine, and we were in a biology class together, and there was an assignment to write a term paper. And so one night we were having dinner, and my roommate said, how about if we write on the creation-evolution controversy? 
And I said, great, don't know anything about it, but let's look into it. So we started studying it together, and we read some books and so forth, and we began to write uh, a pair of different term papers, but that were, that were somewhat coupled. Oops. And that ended up being the beginning of what has turned out to be a lifelong pursuit of this topic for me. I have had opportunity to study it, to do some research in it, actual, actual real lab research. Uh, as part of my regular research program, I've been able to speak, teach, debate, but the most fun has come the last 13 or so years where I've had the opportunity 15 times now to go to People's Republic of China and, and teach and lecture. And I've been able to talk about this topic every time I've gone. And I just got back actually just a little over a week ago from two weeks over there teaching at Nanjing University where I presented it. Not only, uh, I actually gave a sermon at a church, uh, a English, English service of a three self church on this topic, but then I was able to talk about it in, in my material science class and it fits because it really does fit. And it's so interesting to see the wheels turn because these students, bless their hearts, they're raised with atheism, scientific materialism, and they hear this and they, they just kind of pinch themselves. I'm sitting in school and I'm hearing that God is real from a science perspective. And you can just see that they're just going, they're, they're just taken aback. And I had that same day, I had the opportunity to share the gospel in detail with one of the students and it was a wonderful time. So that's where I'm coming from. And uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight is this whole topic of trying to understand time scales. So first of all, I want to introduce something that you already know, but I'm just going to kind of maybe formalize it a little bit. Two different ways of knowing. One way is what we call, what the scriptures call, general revelation. And this is the way that we can learn about God through the created world, essentially through science. And so the passage in Romans 1 that I just read part of it, this is the, probably the key passage on general revelation, because it talks about how God makes himself known through what has been made. And so that is a way of knowing. Uh, and it's important, I think, to recognize that if you look at the history of modern science, all of the movers and shakers of modern science were guided by general revelation. Every one of them had a deep conviction. They, they were all theists, by and large, and they all had a conviction that the, the universe, the world, was rationally made, and so it could be understood because it was made by an intelligent mind. And so here's a list, and it's, it's the who's who of 17th and 18th century science. Every one of those folks was a theist, and many of them were Christians. And as you look down that list, you'll see that you've got all many movers and shakers in physics, uh, chemistry, biology, medicine, uh, geology. And, and so they were guided by that conviction that we can understand the created world because it was made by a rational mind that, that thinks kind of like we do, or we think like, like he does, something like that. Well, the other way of knowing is what you might call special revelation. And this is, of course, the scriptures. And so there's all kinds of passages we could point to on that. Uh, John 1 uh, captures this really well. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He made, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's, of course, the ultimate revelation of who God is, his, his son, Jesus. But then uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, training, and righteousness. And then Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So those are two sources of ways of knowing that are important if we're going to be looking into the origins topic. So a little bit about the age controversy. How did it get started and how did, how did we get to where we are today? Well, as far as I can tell, maybe the first person who actually wrote about this was St. Augustine, St. Augustine uh, back in 400 AD. And so he wrote in his book, The City of God, this concerning the Genesis days. He said, as for these days, it is difficult, perhaps impossible to think, let alone explain in words what they mean. Mm -hmm. But at least we know that it, meaning the Genesis creation day, is different from the ordinary day with which we are familiar. 
So that was some of the earliest writings where uh, key theologians in the history of the church were beginning to ask these questions. Well, if we jump forward to uh, the 1600s, Bishop Usher in the UK uh, decided that he was going to try to date the creation event by using the genealogies in the New Testament. And so he landed at 4004 BC. And then jumping up to the 20th century, uh, there was a, a key development in academia, and it was, it was called the, the, basically the development of higher criticism, which is basically a, a way of trying to understand an ancient text by coming to grips with its historical context as accurately as you can. It's a perfectly good, perfectly good way of going at it, and it's something that's now used all the time, including by Bible scholars. Uh, but it was basically uh, viewed as somewhat of a threat to the church, and so in this book called The Fundamentals, The Testament of the Truth, uh, is as a reaction against it, creation and the fall of men, which are absolutely true, the Garden of Eden, they were named as one of the five key fundamentals, and that was a good thing. Well, a few years later, about a decade later, uh, the World Christian Fundamentals Association <coughs> conference occurred, and there was strong disagreement voiced against neo-Darwinian evolution, because that was taking more and more of the, of the spotlight in the US. And then uh, a few, later, few years after that was the famous Scopes Monkey Trial, where basically uh, there was a, quite a debacle that went on there. And the literal 24-hour creation day at that point became a point of dogma in American fundamentalism. And then jumping forward a um, few more decades, uh, in 1961, Henry Morris wrote The Genesis Flood where he attempted to account for all major geologic formations in terms of the effect of the flood of Noah. And then a very few years later, the Creation Research Society was formed by him and goes on to this day. And then jumping forward a little closer to the present, uh, 1997, Ken Ham establishes an organization called Answers in Genesis, and the Creation Museum is built. And throughout all this time, in the US at least, many people in churches are basically being persuaded to come to the point of view that the young earth, the re recent creation point of view, uh, needs to be a point of dogma. And in fact, some people and some organizations go so far as to say that anybody who doesn't believe it, any Christian who doesn't believe it, is actually a heretic. So that's where we are. And in order to kind of show what, what this way of thinking is all about, I'm going to show three statements of faith from Answers in Genesis, because I think they're very telling. And they have several of them, but these are just three of them. So one of them is that scripture teaches a recent origin for man and the whole creation spanning approximately 4,000 years from creation to Christ. That's one. Another one, the days in Genesis do not correspond to geologic ages, but are six consecutive 24-hour days of creation. And then the third one is, by definition, no apparent perceived or claimed evidence in any field, including history and chronology, can be valid if it contradicts the scriptural record. And the scriptural record, of course, is defined by what's in the previous two bullets. Of primary importance is the fact that evidence is always subject to interpretation by fallible people who do not possess all information. So that's really very telling, because what it's saying is that this particular view of scripture, which they have in the first two bullets, that's, that's truth. And anybody who comes up with anything that doesn't agree with that 100%, it, it's by definition wrong because they don't have all the information. And that largely determines the way people tend to think uh, in, in, this, in this particular model. Well, obviously, if you take a look at what they're saying, they are pushing very hard what you might call ultra-literalism. And I kind of coined that phrase, but what it means is that we must interpret every passage of the Bible ultra-literally to the word in English, no exceptions made, okay? So I think there's a problem with that. And the problem is simply that if you do so, you may completely miss what the author was trying to say. And this has happened before in the history of the church. For instance, let me show you some passages that have been a major stumbling block for the church in the past. Uh, Psalm 93.1, the Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he is put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. 
And in Psalms again, he set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. And then finally, tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Well, that led the church hundreds of years ago in Europe to conclude that the earth was the center of the universe. And that became dogma to them. Well, then this, uh, this uh, young man named Galileo started doing some observations that kind of said otherwise. And it showed that in our solar system, that is not the case. We're not even the center of our solar system, much less the universe. We are rotating around our sun, we're orbiting around our sun as our other planets. And essentially what happened was that the church ended up basically being made to look pretty foolish because they had this point of dogma that they got by taking an ultra literal reading of these kinds of verses and running afoul with what became a very well established scientific model for the solar system that we live in. Um, a couple hundred years later, another verse ended up being a major stumbling block for the church. And it was, it is he, in Isaiah, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Well, in the 1800s, this led a different group in Europe to conclude that the earth was flat. And so we have something kind of like that showing up, which is taken off the website of the Flat Earth Society, because as you can tell, this model still goes on, this way of thinking still goes on. And um, there's even this interesting fellow named uh, Matt Mike Hughes, I don't know if you've heard him of or not, but he's, uh, he's part of the Flat Earth Society, and he, uh, he has this little homemade rocket, and he straps himself to it or gets in it and he shoots himself up. The idea is that as long as he's up in the air before he comes back down, he's gonna get up there and take some photos and prove that the earth is flat by taking photos from a few thousand feet up in the air. Well, I read that just a, a few months ago, uh, he did it and uh, basically his parachute didn't work coming down <laughs> and he darn near died. And he broke his back, broke a whole bunch of bones, but he got mm -hmm. his photos. Now. I, I appreciate his, uh, his bravery in, in a sense, although it borders on stupidity in my view, because you could get the same photos just by going to the top of a smaller mountain and you'd see the same thing. But if you really wanna know if the earth is flat, there's a much, way, much easier way to find out, and it's the following. Go down to the ocean and go to a seaport where there are ships that leave on a good clear day and watch a major ship leaving port and heading out to sea and take photos of it. So there's, right after it leaves port, there's a few minutes later, there's a few minutes after that, and there's a few minutes after that. It's sinking. Now either, <laughs> right, either that ship is sinking or the earth is round. So call the, call the captain, get on the ham radio and say, are you, are you sinking? And he'll say, no. Well, if you know how fast he's going, if you know the height of his ship, and if you know when you took your photos, you can actually calculate pretty accurately the, the curvature of the Earth, just from those three numbers, or sets of numbers. So, all this to say, a little time in cheek, but all this to say that the church in the past has really gotten caught with its intellectual pants down because it <laughs> insisted on a, on a doctrine that was based on ultra-literalism. And if it basically ran afoul with what pretty much anybody with any scientific training knew. I would submit to you that the same thing is going on today with the age of the Earth and the age of the universe. So what I'd like to do uh, is, is make this point at this point. So if we say something is figurative in the scriptures, it doesn't mean it's mythical. That's what I think folks tend to think in the young Earth uh, movement. So as an example, Jesus says this, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who, come to, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he, sh he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, please don't take that literally. Jesus is not a literal door, obviously. We, we know that, right? It's, it's a, figurative, a figure of speech. He's the way in and out of the kingdom so to speak. Another one, another point, figurative doesn't mean wrong. So another passage, again, quoting from Jesus, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Okay, 
we don't take that literally because Jesus, if, if we say, oh, Jesus teaches us to hate our family, then that would obviously contradict a whole bunch of other scriptures. We don't say that, right? We say, well, we, the way we understand this is unless our relationship with God is the most important relationship in our life, more so than our family mem members, we can't really be his disciple. So that's the problem with the, the ultra-literalism point of view. So there are really important questions we need to ask in Bible interpretation. And here are, I think, five of the most important ones. What's the historical setting of the passage? What's the literary context of the passage? What are the grammatical structures that the author uses? What was the word usage at the time, the contemporary at the time word usage all about? Are there parallel passages? And what's the genre of the book we're reading? Actually, six, not five. But those are the kinds of things we need to look into in order to do Bible interpretation right, in my view. So against that backdrop, let's take a look at Genesis 1, which is the, you know, the leading, obviously leading passage on creation. So I just picked uh, a few key verses, not the whole thing. Uh, I just want to point out a few things. So we have there at the beginning, um, the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light, and there was light. That was day one. Okay, that's all we're told. And then jumping down to day three, we have the, the creation of vegetation. And then in the, in, in the fourth day, starting in verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the light from the, the day from the night. For they shall be, let them be as signs and, and for seasons, for days and for years. Let them be lights in the expanse of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Now, do you see any problems just on the base, basis of what we've looked at so far if you're going to take an ultra-literal approach here? Anybody see any issues that you might have with that? Well, how can you have light before you have the sun created on the floor? Okay, that's a good one. There's a mention of the creation of light in verse 1, but then the, the stars aren't created or the sun anyways until day 4. Anybody see any other problems? The day wasn't defined until day 4. It wasn't defined how long is the day before the... We're just thinking in terms of the chronology. Do you, do you oh, see any other any other issues on chronology here? I'll give you a hint. What do we know vegetation needs to grow? We gotta have sunlight. But how can how can vegetation be created on day three when the sun wasn't created until day four? How does that work? So that's the kind of problem that you get. And, and over the years, I've read some of the most amazing paragraphs by people trying to work their way around this, holding to an ultra-literal type way of reading it. And it's, it's just almost laughable. Because I, th I think as you look at this, you would say, OK, so we, we clearly have truth here, but we don't have literal blow by blow, chronological, make a schedule out of it type truth. We know what happened, but we don't know all the details like you might try to extract if you take an ultra literal point of view. So, what does the Bible say and what does it not say about creation? What it does say, what's absolutely crystal clear from the text, is that God is the creator and sustainer of the universe. No question about it. He also created according to his word several passages we won't take time to read. What's not clear from the text is exactly when he created, because it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say, it doesn't give us a date. And it doesn't say in detail how he did, except that it was by his word. It doesn't say, it doesn't say more specifically than that. And to be sure, the Bible is very clear on some dates. For instance, for instance in the opening of the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah writes, in the year of King U that King Uzziah died, which we know was 740 BC, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Okay, so that's a clear date, and that's given to us as such. Or Daniel, uh, in his appointment to the king of Babylon's palace. Uh, in the third year of the reign of jo Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. Okay, that's clear. That's a clear date. But when it comes to 
the creation event, we're not given that kind of detail. Now, what Bishop Usher tried to do was to extract the creation date from the genealogies, in, mainly in, um, in, uh, Adam, or in uh, Matthew and Luke. And so he tried to work backwards from the birth of Christ to the creation of Adam and Eve. But there's, a, there's two big problems with that. One, the words that are used for father and son in those genealogies in the Gospels, they're Ab and Ben, they actually can mean, father can also mean grandfather or great-grandfather or great-great, and same thing with son. Okay, they don't mean just father and just son. They mean descendant, one way or the other. And then if you take a look at the actual genealogies and look at them in detail, you see they don't agree at all. So either they're inconsistent, which means that at least one of them is wrong, or they're not complete. In fact, if you look at the 13 generations leading up to Joseph, there's only one name in common between the two genealogies and the two lists. And it's not even the same, exactly the same. So what do you do? Well, if you're going to stick to ultra-literalism, then now you've, got, you've just created a whole bunch more problems, because now you have to explain why these lists of, of descendants are so different. Okay, some other scriptural considerations. Uh, first of all, the word for day in Genesis, it can mean a solar day, but it can also mean a, an, an indistinct or nondescript period of time, unspecified. If you read Hebrews 4, 4 through 11, you get the sense, a pretty strong sense, that the, the last day of creation, the seventh day, is still going on. Because it talks about how people cannot, if they do certain things, they cannot enter into his rest. Implying that that rest period is still going on. So, so how could the seventh day be a literal 24-hour day? Um, another concept that people have, and, and, and I really uh, don't understand where this one came from, but that there was no death before the fall. Well, let's take a look at the passages on that. Okay, so Romans 5.12. Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men. doesn't say to plants and animals, because all sin. That's interesting. Okay, well, even more interesting is in Genesis 2.17, but of the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Well, Adam didn't die the day that he ate, did he? Physically. But he did die spiritually. And then 1 Corinthians 15, uh, For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Okay, well, Jesus came to restore us to God, to restore our spiritual lives. He did not come to give us physical immortality, right? Because he didn't do that. So all of this points to death through sin being spiritual death, not physical death. Okay, so let's go on to the next part, and that is the scientific considerations. So... The main methods that, that we have used to date not only the Earth, but also the Moon and meteorites that have come into Earth is radiometric dating. And so uh, a little bit of review uh, of how that works. Uh, here's the periodic chart of the elements. And every one of those elements is given by, there's a symbol, a chemical symbol S, and then there's a couple of numbers associated with it. Lower left typically is the number Z, which is the atomic number. It's the number of protons in the nucleus. And then there's an M, um, uh, 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 M, which is on the up, typically on the upper right. That's called the mass number, and that's the number of protons and uh, neutrons in the nucleus. And it turns out that if you go up to uh, the atomic number of 84, which is right... I can't quite read it here. Yeah, it's kind of blurry. I think it's that one. Polonium, okay. From polonium on... Uh, basically, uh, everything, every isotope is unstable. Okay? Prior to that, not so. And by isotopes, what I mean, an isotope is a family of elements. They all have the same Z, but they have different Ns, because they have different numbers of, of neutrons in the nucleus. So everything, every nucleus, every isotope of every nucleus above 84 is unstable against what's called nuclear decay reactions. And for elements less with Z less than 84, there's at least one stable isotope. For instance, for carbon, okay, carbon-6, uh, 
this number, that, that's what makes carbon carbon. But M can vary between uh, 8 and 22, depending on the number of nuclei in the, or number of um, uh, neutrons in the nucleus. And so if it's 12, that's the most common element. 90, almost 99% of carbon is carbon 12, and that's not radioactive. Um, but carbon 13, uh, this one is actually stable as well. Then there's very small amounts of carbon 14, which, are, uh, which is radioactive. So carbon-14 is made in the upper atmosphere. Uh, if you have uh, cosmic rays bombarding the atmosphere, nitrogen absorbs one, becomes carbon-14, and that one's radioactive. But the two, the two stable isotopes, which account for the rest of the mass, they are not radioactive. Well, the point is, is that once we have a radioactive nucleus isotope, its decay is very well understood. So we can do dating with it. And so what we do is we look at the rate at which a radioactive isotope in, an L, in a mineral decays. And the process is what we call parent to daughter. So you have a parent nucleus that gives rise to a daughter nucleus through radioactive decay. And the radioactive decay involves emitting particles of some kind. And so there are three common kinds. Alpha decay, where the emitted particle is a helium nucleus. Beta decay, where the emitted particle is, is either a positron or an electron. And then uh, gamma decay, where the emitted particle is a, is a high energy photon or a gamma particle, gamma ray. So the decay kinetics of these nuclei is a very well understood process. There is a half-life associated with each one of these processes. These can be measured very accurately, typically to within a few percent. And the range of half-lives across all the different radioactive elements ranges from just a few minutes up to billions of years. So there's potential for doing dating based on the, the rate of decay of these nuclei. And, and another very important point is that the half-lives are constant to within a few percent in all geologically relevant environments. Some people have tried to dismiss radioactive dating by saying, well, something weird happened to speed up the decay process and make the rock look old. Well, we know of no process in, in or, ordinary geology, or anywhere on the planet for that matter, or in space for that matter, that's going to change the half-lives. The only thing that can change the half-life is certain kinds of high-energy particle decay in a nuclear reactor. That can, in, in the short term, that can cause a change in half-life. But once you take it out, it goes back to normal again. So a couple of critical points regarding what we find in rocks on Earth. First of all, we don't find any so-called parentless isotopes that have a half-life of less than a half a billion years. None. Okay, what do I mean by a parentless isotope? I mean one that was not generated by decay of something else. It got solidified into a rock and without its parent, so to speak, and there it sits to this day. And what we find is that those isotopes are no longer found unless they have a source, unless they have a parent to replenish them. If they're parentless, they're gone. They've decayed to something else. But by looking at what they've decayed to, we can work backwards and we know what used to be there. And there's nothing with a half-life of less than half a billion years. At the same time, uh, there are lots of other isotopes that have half-lives longer than about a billion years that are found everywhere throughout the Earth. So that right there gives us a bracket on the age of rocks. And it's somewhere between at least a few billion years and at most a few tens of billions of years. And so the age of the Earth is in that bracket. OK, so how do we actually do it? <clears throat> well, we need to understand the rate at which this decay process occurs. So let's take a very simple reaction. It's just going to be a single A turning into B, parent to daughter. And Radioactive decay is a sort of a stochastic probabilistic process. That is to say, within a, if you have a radioactive substance and you have a certain number of atoms there, within a certain amount of time, some fraction of them are going to decay, but you have no idea which ones it's going to be. And it's because it's a process driven by something called quantum mechanical tunneling. And the best you can say is any given one has a probability of decaying in this amount of time, but I can't say that this one will and this one won't. Okay. So there is a, typically a parameter called lambda, which is called the decay constant. And the probability of decay of something is in, within an amount of time delta t is just lambda times delta t. And if delta t is a short amount of time, then, uh, well, it is a short amount of time in the equations I'm about to develop. 
So here's our decay constant, and it can be thought of as a sort of a probability per unit time of decay. And so the, if the probability of decaying in delta T is lambda times delta T, then one minus that is the probability of the, of the nucleus not decaying. That's in one <laughs> period of time delta T. If there's two periods of time delta T, then it's the same thing squared. And if I have n periods of time, short periods of time, delta T, then it's this to the nth power. Well, if I do a little bit of algebra on that, I can reduce that very quickly to, instead of having uh, this gangly thing here, I can use the exponential e, the base e, that is well known in calculus. And then I get a very simple equation for the probability of survival of the nucleus. It is just going to be e to the minus lambda over t. So if I have, let's suppose I have a going to b, and I initially have some number n, that's the number of a that I have at time zero. The number of n's that I or a's that I have at time t is simply going to be given by n of n a of zero times e to the minus lambda t. Very simple exponential decay curve. Very, very simple. <laughs> well, let me plot it. You'll see. Okay. So there's the equation I just had. That's how much A is going to be there after time T. Um, the amount of B that's going to be there is going to be the amount of B that was there initially plus the amount of B that came in from A, which is given by that. And if I play with these equations algebraically, it's straightforward to find a direct relationship between the half-life which is the time it takes for half the stuff to go away, and the decay constant, and it's given simply by this. So now here's the plot. Now let's suppose I have 50 atoms of A, and I want to know how much A am I going to have as a function of time and how much B. Well, that's what my A population is going to look like, and that's what my B population is going to look like. I had a little bit of B to begin with, that's why that's not zero, and I had 50 of A, and so A is going to decay, B is going to grow, and the half-life is going to be the amount of time it takes for half the A to disappear, which is right here. Okay? Very straightforward. Very repeatable. Very difficult to get the wrong answer, actually. Really hard to get the wrong answer here. Okay, so how would you date a rock with this? That sounds bad. Dating a rock. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I just thought of it. <laughs> dating a rock star, maybe, but not dating a rock. Okay, so we're going to talk about igneous rocks, and these are going to be rocks that solidify from lava, basically, or magma. So what happens is, as volcanoes go off, you know, you get molten lava, and so now you have this flow, and it's full of different elements, and then sooner or later that, that magma solidifies. Once it solidifies, then those elements are locked in, at least for the moment. Okay? So... In principle, if you do the right measurements, you can, looking at the concentrations of radioactive elements in that rock, you can figure out how long it's been since that rock solidified, which is considered to be the age of the rock. So you need to know how much of the parent uh, is there now and how much of the daughter is there now. And then you also need to know what the initial concentrations of both parent and daughter were. That's, that's a very important. You also have to know that there was no leaching, that is, chemical sequestration, removal of either parent or daughter. In other words, you, you need to know that the rock didn't erode and lose some of either its parent or daughter. And so it becomes incumbent on people who are going to use this method to do cross-checking. So to use two different radiometric clocks or more to try to cross-check one another and look for consistency. So let me give you, I'm going to show you three different clocks that are very useful in, in dating rocks. One is the uranium lead clock. So there are two different isotopes of uh, uranium that decay to lead. There's uranium-238 that decays to lead-206, and the half-life for that is 4.5 billion years. And there's, there's uranium-235 going to lead-207, and the half-life for that is 0.7 billion years. And because you always have all isotopes of an element, when, if, you find, if you find one element in any environment, you will also find its isotopes there in constant proportion. So you're going to find, in a rock, you're going to find uranium-238 and uranium-235 together, because they're, they have the same chemistry. So chemistry doesn't distinguish between isotopes. It's going to grab them in the same proportions that they're found in the environment. So what you can do then is you can use these two as two independent clocks. 
Now, it turns out that lead can definitely be leached out of these minerals because there's radiation damage caused by the uranium. It's, it's, as it's, it's, it's decaying away, it gives off alpha particles. That does damage to the crystal. It creates defects in the crystal. Water can come in there and wash out the lead. So we have to be able to uh, eliminate the possibility that lead was leached out of the rock. But let's assume for the moment that it wasn't, and I'll show you how we check for that in a minute. Okay, so we can play with the equations and we can write down this formula that relates the ratio of, the, of basically lead 206 to uranium 238 and puts it in the form of an equation which can be plotted. So uh, lead with a star behind it, that is radiogenic lead. That's lead that's created by these, these decay reactions. So if you plot this equation, for different values, this is, this is basically lead-206 divided by uranium-238 as a function of the lead-207 to uranium-235. So if you, if you plot that along the x-axis and this along the y-axis, assuming that there was no leaching, you will, for different amounts of time, you will end up with this curve thing up here, which is called the Concordia curve. Well, at different points along here, the, there are different times at which you will have these values of this ratio. So this is theoretical, if you will, the curve. Then you go and you find a rock that you want to date, and you, you date different parts of the rock. And if all of your points that you get from the rock, if they all land on the same place on this curve, you know that that rock was not disturbed, and you can believe the date. However, uh, if you do your measurements and you find that they, they all fall at different amounts of time, what is typically found is that rather than falling on a curve and on the same point on the curve, they typically fall on a straight line. So now let's suppose your data from your rock is consists of these points here. You plot them up and then you put a straight, you, you fit a straight line to them and you end up then with uh, th this line intersecting the Concordia curve at two different places, one up here and one down here. This is the date at which the solidification occurred, and this is the date at which time, time leaching started. So if you get this, you know that you can't get an accurate age. If, your curve, if, your, if all your points from your rock all fall at, at one point, like let's say 1.5 billion here, then that's your age. Okay, so you use the two clocks as checks to one another. Okay? Make sense? All right, let's take a look at another one. <clears throat> oh, before I do that, um, some of the oldest minerals on Earth have been dated by this technique. And so the zircons, uh, which are basically zirconium silicate minerals from Australia, these are some of the oldest rocks on Earth. And so what you find in here is that you have uranium that is substituted for zirconium in the lattice, in the silicate lattice. And it turns out that the the lead uh, can't substitute at the time of formation for the rock. It can't do that because it's too big. These are the radii of these different elements. And so there's zirconium, there's uranium, and there's lead. Well, uranium has a smaller radius than zirconium, so it can fit. It can go into the crystal without straining it. But lead cannot because it's much bigger than zirconium. So when the rock is forming, there will be no lead in there to speak of. And it'll, it'll be uranium, but then as the rock ages, the uranium will decay to lead. And so by measuring the amount of uranium, the amount of lead, then you can, and using the techniques on the previous page, you can get some ages. And so here are, uh, this is from a paper in Nature some years ago, but here's, here's one mineral, here's another. And as you look, you can see that different parts of the rock give uh, the same age with an experimental error. And it is uh, on the order of 4.3, 4.4 billion years of age. It's among the oldest rocks that are found on the, on the Earth. Okay. So here are some a more general set of results. So oldest rocks on Earth, about 4.4. Virtually all meteorites, about 4.6 billion years of age. Lunar specimens, about 4.1. Uh, oldest lunar specimens, about 4.5. And so basically, the best model for creation of the solar system, the best physical model, equates the age of the Earth with the age of meteorites, and shortly thereafter, the age of the moon. And then all of this is consistent with what we find across the board, that is, no, no uh, parentless isotopes with half-lives less than half a billion years, lots of isotopes with half-lives greater than 
uh, a billion years. These ages fit this rule very, very well. Okay, second one, potassium argon. So this one involves potassium-40 decaying to argon-40 and giving off a, a beta particle. And the problem is, uh, well, it's not a problem quite yet, but we can say that uh, the, the argon does escape molten phases uh, when, when they're molten, but it, then it's trapped, it becomes trapped in the solid, uh, unless that solid happens to be underwater, then it has some problems. Now air, if you take a look at its com chemical composition, it's about 1% argon. So you have to think about the possibility that in your rock, some of the argon was going to have gotten trapped from the atmosphere. And that's what we're going to call non-radiogenic argon. It's going to be trapped at solidification. We've got to correct for it, otherwise we're going to get fooled. So if you take a look at air, uh, argon-40 is the, by far and away the most uh, abundant. Argon-36 is much less abundant, smaller isotope. They're about 300 to 1 ratio in air. So if you measure the amount of argon-36 that's in the rock, and you use this isotope, this, this ratio, you can find the amount of argon-40 that would have been there in there from the atmosphere when it first formed. So you do the math, you do the algebra, and you can get an age for the rock based on the amount of argon-40 and the amount of potassium-40 that's in there, having corrected for the amount of non-radiogenic argon-40. Now there are some caveats though. One of them is that if the rock is too young, you can't really do this because there's not yet enough argon that's built up in it. Uh, and then uh, it turns out that some of the rocks that generate or generate deep underground have a lot more so-called parentless argon that is coming in from the environment that is expected from air exposure. So that can give you an age that's too large. So how do you determine if these things are going on? Well, there's a second test, and you have to do a second test, and that's called argon-argon dating. It's another method that, gets, that helps us figure out if we've had any chemical disturbance to this rock. So argon, well, so this is what we're trying to figure. We're trying to see if this clock will work well, and we're going to use argon-argon dating to find out. And the way we do that is we put the rock in a nuclear reactor, and we irradiate it with thermal neutrons, and we, the potassium that's in there absorbs neutrons and becomes argon-39, which then decays, sorry, potassium-39 absorbs neutrons, becomes argon-39, gives off protons, and uh, the half-life for that is about 270 years. Okay, so it turns out that, uh, as I said, all isotopes of an element, they stick together because they have the same chemistry. So your potassium-39, your potassium-40 are going to be found in the same places in a rock, and therefore the argon-39 and ar the radiogenic argon-40, is they're also going to be at the same places in the rock. So what you do then is you simply do this irradiation, you go ahead and look at your decay, and then you heat the rock up and you look for the argon-40 and argon-39 to come out in a constant proportion because the heat will drive the argon out because it's an inert gas. And if it comes out and you can measure that with a mass spectrometer in the same proportions, then you're good and you don't have any excess argon-40 and you can get a reliable date. But if you get the argon-39 and argon-40 coming out at different proportions, then all bets are off and you, you can't date the rock that way. And so you'll see a plot something like this. Uh, for many different uh, specimens, or different inclusions within the same rock. You'll see this nice constancy here. Okay? So that's a second tool. Okay, a third tool is the rubidium strontium clock. <clears throat> and so this is rubidium 87 decaying to strontium 87, giving off a beta particle, half-life about 49 billion years. And uh, if you have non-radiogenic isotopes of strontium, then obviously they're not going to increase with time because they're just sitting there. So what you do is you normalize the amount of strontium and the amount of rubidium, the, the isotopes involved in the reaction, you normalize those to the amount of strontium-86 because that's not changing over time. And so let's suppose you have a rock that's got different inclusions in it, which I show schematically as these different colors. What you do is you make a plot uh, you, you do the measurements, and if you, what, what you end up getting, basically, is you end up getting, for a rock that, that, that lets you analyze it, because it's reliable, you end up with, basically, this curve right here, this, this line. So when the rock is analyzed, the strontium uh, 87 to strontium 86 divided by rubidium 87 to, to strontium 86 will be linear like that, 
And if you work backwards in time, then it would have looked like this when it first solidified, when this rock first solidified. And if you see this kind of a clean connection between this hypothetical curve, which is what it would have been like at solidification, and this one, if you see that all the different uh, portions of the rock land on this line so that this slope is what we call single value, then with this formula, you can get the age from the slope. But on the other hand, if you find data points like this, where uh, you don't, your data during the time of analysis doesn't land on this line, then you've probably had some leaching and you can't, you can't believe the results. But that's just, you know, that's just three of the clocks and there are many others. And this, I hope, illustrates for you how you can use this very reliably and get good numbers out of it. And so here are uh, a whole bunch of different minerals from Greenland, dated by different techniques. There's their ages. You can see that the agreement is really good. Well, radiometric dating isn't the only technique. There are others. And one of the most interesting ones to me is one that comes from plate tectonics. So in the Pacific Ocean, we know that the Pacific plate is moving northwest to the northwest across the Pacific Ocean at a rate of about five to 10 centimeters per year. And this is happening over a part of the Earth called the asthenosphere. And this is basically what gave rise to the Hawaiian Islands and the Midway Islands. So what you have is you have this plate that's moving over this stationary fissure that's, that's yielding basically volcanism. And as the plate moves over, this fissure spawns volcanoes along pretty much a straight line to the northwest. And so there are about 30 volcanoes, either active or extinct, between Midway and Hawaii, and this is over a 2,400 kilometer area. And if you can date the, the lava from these different volcanoes using potassium argon, but you can also date those volcanoes using the, the, the continental drift, or the, the plate tectonics. And so if you make a plot of the dates that, are, that you get from the drift rate against the dates that you get from potassium argon, you can see that they correlate really, with it, really very well. And uh, if you take Midway as an example, the potassium, uh, the plate drift uh, age is 27 million years and the potassium argon date is 28 million years. So the agreement's really good. So another way to kind of cross check. Okay, so that's, that's Earth. That's how we date Earth, Moon, meteorites, things like that. Any questions on that before I go on to talking about the the bigger picture of the universe. Yes, sir. When you say something has a half-life of so many billion years, how do you determine that? Because we're not a billion years old. So what, what kind of projection do you do to determine that? Um, what you can do, well, basically, it's, uh, you, you can get very good numbers. Even over a finite amount of time, you're not going to have a lot of decay. You will have some. And with, with, with really good instrumentation, you can see decay rates all, as slow as they are. You can see them happening, and you can get numbers which then give you, they give you the concentration as a function of time over a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And if you plot that up, you can see that you're on this decay curve, and you're only on the very top of it. But then you can extrapolate it to the half-life to get that. Good question, though. <clears throat> Other questions? All right, let's go on to the universe. So how do we know about the age of the universe? A lot of what we know about the age of the universe is from modeling what's true about it today. So we have a expanding universe and this expanding universe has been explained with a model of origins called the Big Bang model, which I'm sure you've heard about. And the Big Bang was actually given its name by Fred Hoyle who didn't like the Big Bang because it pointed to a beginning, which he didn't like, he's an atheist. And prior to the Big Bang being developed back in the 40s, the leading model of origins was the steady state model, which basically postulated that the Earth was infinitely old, just kept oscillating. And that's what a lot of atheists really loved. And then, and then this upstart named Einstein came along and a few other people, and, and up comes the Big Bang model, which points back to a definite beginning. And so Hoyle didn't like that, so he called it the Big Bang, to, almost in sarcasm, and the name stuck. But it makes it sound like a chaotic explosion, but it's nothing of the kind. And in fact, in the, in the words of Hugh Ross, uh, astrophysicist, uh, it can be described as a powerful yet carefully planned and controlled release of matter, energy, space, and time, subject to fine-tuned physical constants and laws. 
So what we have is an expanding universe, which started off a long time ago as a very small, very hot speck of pure energy and led to what we have today, including us. And so the, the, the thing was tiny. We're talking 10th of a millimeter diameter. The thing was phenomenally hot. We're talking 10 to the 32 degrees. That's one with 32 zeros behind it, worth of temperature. Extremely hot, pure energy. At a point in time, it began to expand. And during the first fraction of a second, it expanded extremely rapidly by a factor of 10 to the 50th. And this is called the inflationary period. Then after that, this, the expansion rate slowed down and it continued to expand. But an important point is that cosmologists have determined that the entire structure of the known universe was imprinted onto this little tiny speck during this first fraction of a second. As one Nobel Prize winning physicist who said, he says, this sounds to me just like Genesis 1-1. He's not a believer, but I think he's right. I think when it says in the scriptures in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it's exactly what he's talking about. Okay, why do we think that? Well, it's because, among other things, the rate of expansion has been so carefully choreographed. Because of the expansion rate being just right, we now have, after 15 billion years of expansion, we have a very stable, highly functional universe. And people have looked into the rates of expansion. And one of the most impressive numbers to me is that early on, the rate of expansion in, in order, well, okay, so let me, let me explain. If the universe expands too quickly, it just flies away and nothing can form. If it expands too slowly, gravity eventually causes it to collapse on itself. It has to expand in the, in the Goldilocks regime, just right. Otherwise, it's gonna be a disaster. Well, uh, Alan Guth, back in the uh, 80s, uh, did a, uh, a calculation, published it in Physical Review, where he showed that the initial expansion rate had to be tuned to one part in 10 to the 55th in order for our universe to be what it is today. Okay, now if you know anything about engineering, you know that that's really, really, really impressive. To what can we compare it? Of all the engineering marvels in our world today, to what can we compare it? Well, we can compare it to something right down the street. We can compare it to the LIGO because the LIGO is the most precise instrument, measuring instrument that mankind has ever developed. So let's talk about how good it is. So if you know about the LIGO, it stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It is a optical device that lets us detect the gravity waves that, that uh, Einstein predicted would be emitted when very heavy objects like black holes and neutron stars collide. They send a ripple out through space time. In principle, you can detect that if you have a sensitive enough instrument. Well, the LIGO is that. It's a four kilometer long uh, interferometer. Um, there's, that's just a picture, that's a schematic picture of it, but uh, each of these arms is a vacuum tube that's, that's four kilometers in length. And so light is generated uh, by a laser. It's split into two beams, which go down and, and bounce back. And then they're, they, the two light beams recombine and go to a detector here. And if this mirror moves relative to that mirror, you get a disturbance in the interference pattern. So here's some actual photos. Here's the LIGO that we have uh, out in Richland. Here's its twin in Louisiana. There's now a third one in Italy called Virgo. And so the reason you have to have more than one is because as you can imagine, the seismic noise anywhere is gonna be huge. It's gonna be much bigger than, or at least as big as a gravity wave disturbance. So every time a wave beats on the Washington coast, they get a signal, it's that sensitive. When the wind blows, they get signals. When people drive their cars by, they get some signals that they come too close. The point is, is that the seismic noise in Washington and in Louisiana is going to be totally different. The gravity wave is going to send the same signal to both places separated by about two and a half million, or two and a half thousandths of a second. That's how long it'll take the gravity wave to go from uh, either Washington to Louisiana or the other way. So if you see a gravity wave signal, it's gonna be superimposed on the seismic noise and will be the same on both places. <clears throat> well, in order to be able to detect that, the, the mirrors down here, which bounce the light back, they have to be able to detect extremely small movements. And they can, they can detect movements as small as 10 to the minus 19 meters, which is one billionth the size of a hydrogen atom. Very, very tiny. And so when you have a collision of, of black holes or neutron stars or both colliding, 
then there's going to be this ripple sent out in space-time. And, and when, it, when it comes, uh, there's going to be, the, the, in, in the control booth, this is the control room at the Hanford LIGO, you've got these signals. And what's going to happen is you're going to, as, as, the, as the gravity wave passes through, the interference pattern is going to go from being circular to being elliptical in one direction as this mirror moves. And then a fraction of a second later, it's going to go to elliptical in this direction as this mirror moves. And then it's going to go back to being circular again. And so starting in uh, 2015, after a big upgrade, they saw their first black hole collision. And there's what the signals look like at Hanford and at Livingston. You can see that they're the same. These are calculated signals, which you expect if two black holes of the masses that they deduced collide. And there's almost perfect agreement. This happens because of the fact that this device is fine-tuned to one part in 10 to the 22nd. Now, that's extremely impressive. As I said, that's the best we have ever done. But it's nothing compared to 10 to the 55th. So if we're impressed by this engineering, how much more impressed should we be by the engineering that it would take to make mm -hmm. the Big Bang event happen and happen well? It can't possibly be an accident, is what I'm trying to say. And from that, we get ages. So we get from the Big Bang, we get about 15.5 billion years. From the color luminosity fitting from stars, we get about 17 billion years. And from mass density and considerations, we get about 19 billion years. And the error bars are fairly big here. But this is the order of magnitude we're talking about for the age of the universe, and for some very good physics reasons. OK, so now you may be thinking, well, what are we going to do with this? It sure seems like Genesis is saying, maybe saying that the Earth was you know, made 6,000 years ago. Some people may, may say that. So is there, is there a way to reconcile the old and the young models for the universe that doesn't involve saying that the days in Genesis are indefinite periods of time or anything of the like? Is there another way around this problem? The answer is, I believe, yes. And it has to do with a solution that actually comes right out of general relativity and some very fancy instrumentation that we now have today. So basically, it has to do with the fact that time passes at different rates in different places depending on three things. The rate at which time passes for us, sitting here on Earth, or anybody else anywhere in the universe, it depends on the relative motion of Earth compared to someplace else where you'd like to know the rate at which time passes. It depends on the speed. The faster something is going, the more time slows down. And it depends on the lo local gravitational field strength. How, how strong is gravity there? Well, let's talk about that. So if we're going to do some measurements like this, we need to be able to, to tell time very, very accurately. So how do we tell time? Well, we actually use light we use the frequency that comes out of a cesium maser. Now, a maser is like a laser, only involves microwaves instead of light, so M for microwaves. But a cesium maser, the, the second, has been defined as the time required for that many, 9.2 billion cycles of light from a cesium maser. And this is good because you can build cesium masers anywhere you want, and everybody can measure on their own continent, and they can then agree on what a second is. That's how we measure uh, time these days. So there's a cesium measure. And the uncertainty in this measurement is very small. It's one part in 10 to the 14. And it's been improving over time. So here is the uncertainty in the definition of a second as a function of time. And uh, from the 40s up to the, the present, or a little, not quite the present. But so you can see that our, our knowledge of what a second is is now very, very highly accurate. Okay. So, how does this come into play? Well, it comes into play through something called the Doppler effect, which we all know about. And the Doppler effect is the following. If you have a object that emits a wave, and that object is moving, how you perceive that wave depends on where you are relative to the object. So, let's suppose you've got a car and the guy hits his horn. So, he emits a sound wave. How that sound wave sounds to you depends on whether you're behind the car, in which case the wave is going to elongate, the wavelength will increase, and it sounds like the frequency is going down as the car goes by. You've all, you've all experienced that. Or it's going to go up if, if the car is coming at you. Well, that's for sound, but the same thing is true for light. So the frequency of light, and therefore the definition of a second, 
is going to depend on the relative motion of the source of the light compared to the observer. So, what we can do is the following. We can do some experiments, first of all, to see if this is for real. Some control experiments. And that's been done uh, a number of years ago. A group at Naval Research Labs did a very clever experiment where they put these cesium masers into two commercial jetliners and they flew them on opposite, in opposite directions around the world twice. And they took a third cesium maser and they left it at the Naval Research Lab. And they measured the time change based on the change in frequency of the cesium maser. And so there's the two aircraft that are going around in opposite directions. They have different velocities. They have different, uh, well, they have about pr pretty much the same gravitational field because they're at the same height. But they're going in opposite directions at a reasonably high rate of speed. Special relativity actually predicts that the time dilation for these two is going to be the same because it goes as the, the velocity squared. But general rel relativity doesn't predict that. It predicts that there will be a difference in the rate at which time passes on these two jets given by this formula right here. Mm. <clears throat> so what they did was the following. If you take this equation and you integrate it, you can basically come up with the time difference between the two jets, that's tau, on each of the two jets, and tau zero, that's on Earth. That's at the Naval Research Lab. Well, here's what they got. So for eastward and westward going jets, this is the measured time dilation in nanoseconds, that's billionths of a second, and here it is predicted with this equation. And you can see that the, ac that the accuracy is very good, very good, uh, very, very good agreement between the two. So that proves that the rate at which time goes by depends on relative velocity. So now how can we apply that to origins? Well, the amount of time that's gone by since the beginning is going to depend on where you are in the expanding universe. So if we take a look at the overall time from the Big Bang, so here's the beginning, here's 15 billion years later, within a fraction of a second, within 10 to the minus 4 seconds, you have the first stable matter forming, and the, the universe is extremely hot, really, really hot, 10 to the 12 degrees, uh, 10 to the 13 degrees, and then from that point, which was 10 to the minus 4 seconds after the Big Bang, up to here, 15 billion years later, where now the background temperature of the universe is almost down to absolute zero, you have this much time passing, and you have an expansion of a fact by a factor of 10 to the 12th in the universe. Okay, so how much time goes by depends on where you are in this expanding sphere. So, we're going to talk about two, two times. We're going to talk about Earth time. That's the time measured where we live. And we're going to talk about cosmic time. That's going to be time as measured in an inertial reference frame at the point of origin of the universe. So how do we connect them? A hypothesis for helping us understand the scripture. The hypothesis is the following. That when God gave Moses his revelation of creation, he had to be viewing it from somewhere, just like John had to be viewing the end times from somewhere. Right? So let us assume that from the beginning of creation up to the time of creation of Adam and Eve, the frame of reference that God gave to Moses was, was at the center of the universe. He's watching the universe form, which allows him to talk about the formation of the universe. But then let us assume that at the time when it was time to create people, God shifted his frame of reference to the surface of the earth. If you make that assumption, then here's what happens. You can write an equation down that would connect Earth time with cosmic time. Earth time as a function of cosmic time. And it's going to be, uh, based on the expanding universe, it's going to be a, a simple exponential. T0 is going to be the time when stable matter formed. And the, we're going to have a decay constant K. And if we integrate that, then we can end up with a simple expression that connects Earth time to cosmic time. So here's what it looks like. So we have Earth time along here, and we have cosmic time, which would be Genesis days for the time up to creation of Adam and Eve. Here is the cumulative time in billions of years. Here's Earth time on a per day basis per Genesis day here. Now let's think about the different creation events. So the different creation events are, are basically shown here. We have the first five verses, which talk about creation of the universe. 
the firmaments, the oceans and dry land, uh, the planets and the stars, they become visible in the fourth day. Maybe that's what he was talking about. That's when they became visible to someone on the surface of the earth. Maybe they were in fact created right here, in fact they probably were, and they just became visible at that point. That's why he wrote it that way. Then we have aquatic life and finally land animals. Well, the, the geologic and the cosmological periods of time over which these events occurred are shown over here. Basically, you've got starting period and ending period. This is somewhat, uh, I mean, I specify these for the following reason, is that, and I, I, sh I should have pointed this out before I got to this page. Let me go back one. There is an exponential decay in this curve. So the first Genesis day corresponds to 2 billion years. The second Genesis day corresponds to 1 billion years. The third Genesis day to a half a billion years and so forth. It gets cut in half every Genesis day. And so if I define these dates as a beginning time and an end time for this portion of cosmic history, then I can make a direct correspondence between what we know happened from science here with these dates and what we read in Genesis with these dates. And the correlation is pretty darn good. Now, is it right? I don't know. It might be. But the point is, is that it's a viable way of thinking about the process that lets us come to some reconciliation. It's another way to think about reconciliation, and it's worth doing. So that's the point of that, is that it helps get away from the fundamentalist idea of being so locked into these figurative representations. Correct. And I have bounced this idea off of many people who are you know, in that fundamentalist mode. And by and large, they go, huh, interesting. It's a new thought to them. And I encourage them, I say, boy, you know, try to you know, follow up on this. Think, think hard about it, because it, you know, might, it might be right. It might reconcile. All right, I've gone long enough, and certainly take some questions. But let me summarize it this way. And, uh, I think it's, it's very good that we avoid dogmatism in this area because uh, interpreting Genesis correctly may not be as simple as some people think. And uh, <clears throat> if we do that, we are, I believe, going to run the same risk that the church ran into in Galileo's time. And, and that's not good witness. If we want to reach technologically and scientifically minded people, we need to not be doing things with our theology that, that, ob that completely obviate all of science. Don't make the young earth uh, a point of orthodoxy. Uh, I think that's really, really important because uh, it's, not the, it's not at the same level as the deity of Christ, the fall of man, the inerrancy of scripture, the resurrection, any one of a number of really important doctrines that are worth going to the mat over as Christians. The age of the earth is not one of them. Embrace general revelation for the valid source of information that it is. Okay, uh, there was a book that I read years ago by Arthur Holmes that we knew the title of it was "All Truth Is God's Truth," mm -hmm. and that title I can't even remember what was in the book because he's a philosopher. <laughs> Philosophy doesn't stick with my brain too well, but uh, the title has never left me. All truth is God's truth, and that that does include scientific truth, if you want to call it that. I don't know if you can really find truth in science, but you can find some information that's awfully reliable and awfully useful. <laughs> For instance, one last example, nuclear physics, okay? Nuclear physics has some really cool applications. One of them is nuclear power plants, power generation. And we all benefit from that locally. Another one is radiometric dating. The same physics goes into both of them. The same equations go into both of them. So if we're going to throw this out as being illusionary or by definition wrong, because it doesn't agree with uh, young earth mode, if we're going to be intellectually consistent, we better throw that out as well. And we better start burning dung again for our heat. Because you can't have it both ways. You just can't. If you're going to believe that this works, and you'd have a hard time arguing against it, you just can't throw this out a priori. And then the last point would be, uh, Peter tells us, he says, be ready to make a defense for the hope that lies within you. And so my, my goal in my life and what I will tell anybody who will listen to me is try to strive for a holistic worldview that is intellectually consistent and it's true to scripture, properly interpreted. Okay?
So I'd be happy to take any questions. Sorry, I went a little longer than uh, eight ten, but uh, any any questions? Yeah, great. Hey, can you go back to your table for a second? Sure. Which one? The the the, uh, the, the uh, Gerald Schrader table. What did yeah, you sure. based on his? Yep. Yeah, so, so your your third column, what is, what does that say at the top? What is what does the column mean? Um, the up here. No, the third one from the from the uh, left. Genesis. That, no. Oh, there you go. End. Oh, yeah. End in billions of years. Start in billions of years. Oh, end in billions. Of years. Yeah, this is the start of this oh, okay. period. This would be the end of this particular period. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I also forgot to give credit where credit is due. This was all developed by a wonderful physicist who's a, a actually an Orthodox Jew named Gerald Schroeder. And I, I gave a, a, one of his book titles down there, but he's the guy that came up with this. So I forgot to mention that. When I ran, I'm so sorry, the reason why I brought that up is when I ran uh, Trader's calculation when his book came out with the data the age of the universe that NASA generally uses, except it's 13.7. I got five forty eight days, so pretty close. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I heard you correctly, but when you were talking about the expansion, uh, the rate of expansion, you were talking about how small the initial item was. Yes. You said something about even in its smallness, it it had evidence of all of the elements that, that creation ultimately... No, had. not all the elements, the overall structure of the universe. Well, structure tells bells. That's, that's what God's talking about, yeah. the structure of yeah. the universe. Well, and the, the basis for that is uh, the cosmic background radiation, the 2.75 Kelvin black body radiation that comes from anywhere in the universe. That's now been mapped very accurately in both galactic hemispheres, and so you can find these maps where you see these very slight variations in the temperature of the, the black body heat coming from, it's the leftover heat from the Big Bang. And as cosmologists saw that, they weren't expecting it. They were expecting it to be really uniform. As they put that into their models and worked backwards, they realized that, that this, the overall structure of the universe, which is coupled to that, that radiation pattern, had to have been imprinted on the universe at the time of inflation. That's the argument for intelligent design. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just very difficult to imagine that being a not a directed event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, precisely. And that's, I mean, this is, this is powerful. And uh, I, I will use this one. When I'm giving a, a talk to unbelievers about evidence for design, I will use the, the Big Bang every day because it's just so, man, it's, I, I have some quotes, I don't have them in this PowerPoint, but some quotes from people of the likes of Stephen Hawking and uh, others, and, and they just go, this is pointing straight to God. God bless Stephen, now that he's gone. Yeah. We pray for him. <laughs> yes, sir. I, in all of this, and I really appreciate this presentation and all, I've never heard a discussion of why matter functions as it does. <laughs> yeah. Because why is one electron irreplaceable with another electron, one proton? There had to be, even before the release of this energy that produces this stuff, there had to be a rule of law that produced what we have instead of something else, doesn't it? Isn't that true? Yep. In fact, the laws of physics had to have been in place very early on. They were probably a little different during the inflationary period, because there's evidence that the four fundamental forces were, were very different than they are now. But then there was a slight shift in all that, and the, the laws of physics, uh, which th themselves contained tremendous amounts of information, uh, were in place, and they, in, in concert with the amount of energy and the rate of expansion, you know, gave us what we have. And one of the things I like to tell people is that as scientists, we're really good at describing things, but we can't explain hardly anything. I mean, I can tell you that the force between two gravitational objects 
is going to go is one over the distance between them squared. And it's going to be proportional to the two masses. I can tell you that. I can tell you that the constant that goes in there is the gravitational constant. But why does the force of gravity have that particular form? I can't tell you that. And, and that's the way it is throughout science. We can describe it, but we cannot explain hardly anything. Why is it the way that it is? And why does it work the way that it does? And for the, I think for the unbiased mind, it is as close as you can come to proving the existence of God. You know, proof is generally in the realm of mathematics, but the case for God in, in science is, and, and that's to me, that, that's huge. That's why I do what I do. And that's, I believe, one of the reasons that God called me into the profession was to be able to speak whenever I could, whoever listened, about the connection between the, the scientific enterprise and the practices and him as the author. I can't remember the name of the author, but I just read a book on cosmology in which they're talking now about, in the history of our lifetime, how many of the things that they are finding in science and cosmology that are one-up type things that couldn't be any other way, mm -hmm. uh, like the force of gravity, uh, electronic uh, forces and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, the, they have 140 of them that were listed in the yep. back of the book now. Mm -hmm, right. Of these things had to be what they are in order yeah. for us to have what we Fine have. Tuning. Fine tuning. Fine yep, that's huge. I wish I had it's, it's just growing, the list is growing. Yeah. 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 Scott, so yeah. it seems like the older I get, the faster the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, if getting in a plane and going one direction slows things down a little bit, and going to, do I need to get on a plane going east or west? Yeah. <laughs> to slow things down? Great question. I think it was west was faster. and that was, But this was, uh, mind you, this was 40 nanoseconds. No, it was 100, no, 200 nanoseconds in 48 hours. So <laughs> no great gain. What are you going to do with all that time? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about your last slide, when you exit the radioactive dating, uh -huh. I mean, because I you know, like um, the people who really say, "Oh, radioactive dating doesn't work," I don't think they're saying that the radioactive dating mechanism doesn't work. They're like saying that the initial conditions maybe not have been the ones you know you were using to start your dating. So you know when you exit, it seems like oh you know they say you need to like the radioactive dating doesn't work, but they're not saying that. So it sounds a little bit like yeah, you know, well, that's right. Some people say that, but there are others who will. And there's one guy I know who's really avid about this. He'll say things like, "Well, we know that certain kinds of events can decay, can catalyze radioactive decay. We know that. No, we don't. There's no known force in the terrestrial environment." that can make radioactive decay go any faster. He, he says that all the time, and it's just wrong. Who is he? His name's Donald Chittick. And how about that? Have you heard the, the guy about the shroud of Jesus? What's his name? Uh, Rucker. Uh, <laughs> Rucker guy, what's his name? Yeah. What's Bob. his name, first name? Bob, Bob Rucker? Mm. Yeah, because his whole theory about the shroud and why it turned out to be fake if you do radioactive dating, but he doesn't believe it's fake it's because says, you know, when Jesus uh, was resurrected, you know, there was light. So this like provided, you know, more like particles. So later, you know, when you go and measure it, it seems like, oh, it's young, but actually it wasn't young because all those, you know, uh, nuclei were there from the explosion. This was his theory, for example. So yeah. could this be true? I don't know much about the shroud, so I'm... No, but in general, you know, if you have, like, okay, what happened when Jesus was resurrected, you know? Well, I know the, the Institute for Creation Research people, they, they are famous for running around and finding uh, examples where the dating didn't work and saying, oh, there you go, the technique doesn't work. Well, you know, read, read the rest of the paper, you'll find out that, yes, this, this was rock, the, the dates for this rock were rejected because it didn't pass these tests. I'm just, you know, just yeah. wondering about it. Right. Because, you know, yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Let's give Scott a good hand. Yeah.